Love God, live like Jesus, let the Spirit lead is our mission. We're going to spend the next three Sundays talking about each one of those, and we'll end with let the Spirit lead, which will kick off our week of prayer, letting God lead us by his Spirit, filling us anew in his Spirit as we spend time as a church praying. So love God, live like Jesus, let the Spirit lead. We focus this week on this first aspect of who we are as a church When we think about the mission to love God, it is so core to what it means to be a believer in God that we run on dangerous ground because it can almost seem like a cliche at times that our mission is to love God. I'm reminded of a conversation that I had recently with a person that had just moved to Boise. And odds are there are some of you with us this morning that maybe are new to our valley. I want to welcome you and say you picked a good week to join us. I hope that you'll join us for these next coming Sundays as we really define what God has for us this year. And it's not uncommon for people to be coming to Boise. In fact, there was an article that came out at the end of last year, so a couple weeks ago, by the U.S. Census Bureau that estimated that Idaho is the fastest growing state in our country. Can you believe that? More people are coming to Idaho and Boise specifically is growing faster than any other city in our nation. And I, for one, happen to love that aspect of who we are as a city. I love meeting people who are coming to Boise, mainly because I love hearing about where you all came from. I love hearing about the different cities and states and even different countries that are making our city grow with people that are coming to to live and to to do community with us. And one of my favorite, if I can, um, if I can go down my road of just the favorite area that I love to hear about when people are coming to Boise, it's the people who have come from the beach or the ocean, or the tropics. I love that. If you, if you know me, you know I love the ocean. I love swimming in the ocean. I love sailing. I love just going to the beach as kind of part of our family DNA. And I was talking to someone who had just moved to Boise from this really cool beach community on the East Coast. And I was so excited to hear all about it because it's just something I love. And I had to tell him, like, so sorry you moved to Boise. The closest beach is so far away. Just... And if you're new to Boise, just so you know, you're a a good day's drive from any beach. And so we just started talking about the beach, and I just wanted to hear about uh, all that he loved. And he said, you know, it's really not that big a deal. Uh, You know, growing up in a in a place where the 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 beach was my back my backyard, you'd be surprised. I I actually didn't go to it that often. You just kind of get used to it. And especially after I had kids, it was really hard to make the time at the end of a long day or the end of a long week to load all the stuff and get to the beach. So honestly, we only went probably two or three times a year. And to that, I was like, heresy, that is bad. If I lived near the beach, I would go there every day. And the conversation kind of flipped on its head, though, because he said, you know what? I'm actually really excited to be in Boise because where I came from, we didn't have foothills and mountains. So now that I'm here, I actually kind of want to hear your story about how much you hang out in the foothills. I can't wait to go skiing in the winter, and I can't wait to go mountain biking in the summer. Every time I'm the connector going into the city center, I just stop and stare at the the foothills, and I I just love it here. He said, so what are the good trails? How how often do you go up? And I said, actually, the funny thing is, (laughs) if you live here, you kind of get used to it. Especially after you have a family, um, after a long day and a long week, um, I actually only go up to to ski or hang out in the foothills probably two or three times a year myself. And here is the reason we share that. No matter how beautiful something is, no matter how awe-inspiring the part of the creation that you can touch and get inspired by, there is this dangerous, slow effect that it kind of just wears off. And I'm afraid that sometimes that happens not just with the interaction that we have with the majesty of creation, but with the creator himself. Here's the question as we think about the the mission of loving God for all of us to answer this morning as we think about the year ahead. And for my life, I ask the question to myself as I prepare this message, how is it 
that for those of us who have declared that a desire to follow Jesus and, and we come here specifically to worship God and, and to love him by just sitting under the preaching of his word, how is it that we sometimes can get so busy with the good stuff in our lives that we don't have time to just be with the one who created all of that good stuff. God created the beach and he created the ocean and by his creative power, he makes the sunsets shine with color. God shaped the mountains that we get to look at as we drive into the city center. He moves in the seasons to bring snow and to bring sunshine. How is it that that same God who sent his son into the world to adopt us into his family, we can be so busy in life that we don't have time to sit and love him for all that he has done. One of the missions of our church that we have to redefine and be refreshed in, I pray for this year, and it's a big thing to pray for is that we would be renewed in our love for God that would be awe-inspiring, that we would be inspired by the majesty of who our creator is and what he did to bring salvation into our lives that we celebrate when we gather in this way. Read this psalm with me, Psalm 27, verse 4, by King David, one thing I have asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When we talk about the mission of loving God, we are talking about being a church that is in awe of who he is, desiring just to gaze at the beauty of who God is. Here's another way one of the Psalms puts it in Psalm chapter 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for thee, or longs for, or thirsts for, meaning not just enough to spend a little bit of time in church hearing about God, or going through the routines of a devotion that we could check off the list, but when we're not with him, when we're not spending time in his presence, being renewed and refreshed by a relationship with him, we long for him. We can't wait to get that next glimpse of him, that fresh revelation that he brings as we learn to walk with him. And so we're going to read a passage of scripture that describes the love of God in a walk, the intimacy of a walk. And before I do, I want to, I want to point out that as we think about the three-part mission of our church, to love God and to live like Jesus and to let the Spirit lead, all of those are so important to everything that we do. All of those are the motivation of our gathering and our outreach and our outbreak of all the ways that we want to grow in who we are as a body of believers. But the, the first one is what everything hinges on. Everything after loving God will hinge on whether or not that's a reality for our church and it's a reality for your life. 1 Corinthians 13 is so important to remind us that love has to be the foundation of what we do. Paul writes to that church in Corinth and says that you can have faith that moves mountains, that you can prophesy, you could even speak with the language of heaven, the angelic tongue, but all of that, if there's not a foundation of love that motivates and informs those things, those good things that we could experience in church or in your life walking with God, if we don't have a core love that is underneath everything that we do as a church, those other things are compared to a clanging cymbal. It's just noise. If we lose the love of God as the motivating factor for everything that we do to be called by him and to be used by him, then we become just noise as a church, and it's something that will happen in your life as well. And as we read this passage of Scripture, I want to answer the question, why is it so important to have a foundation of a love for God in everything else that we do. So we start in Micah chapter 6. I want to read verse 8. 
He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. One of the first ways we can answer the question of the morning, why is love of God so foundational? In this passage of scripture, as it describes love by walking humbly with God and intimacy with God that is so close that you are moved in the same direction as he is walking with him, one first way we can answer that is that it says that it is required of us by the Lord. If you are a believer in God, if you have given your life to following Jesus, accepted his free gift of grace that you can be in a relationship with God, then one of the requirements on your life now is that you would love him in a response to all that he has done. In fact, when we think about the story of the Bible and the revelation of God's requirements or commandments or the law of God, Jesus says that it can all be summed up in loving God and in second commandment, great, just like the first, loving people. Now, we need to answer some misconception that sometimes happens around love as a requirement for our lives, that God has commanded us to love him. Because as you hear that, or maybe as you read that, something might come into your mind that says to you, wait a minute, my love for God is a requirement. What does that tell me about who God is? He has made me to love him as a law. That doesn't sound very loving. Here's the reason that is a misconception on how to think about this. And to answer that misconception and to also give a navigation point for the other ways that I want to answer the foundational question of the morning, I want to point back to the book of Genesis. As we have already announced, we're going through the entire Bible as a church together. And last Monday, January 1st, we started in Genesis. And if you are reading along with us, if you've journeyed through Genesis all the way up to halfway through the book now, you've already read some of the distinctions of the design of man to know God in a way that is pointing us to walk with him. And in one of those very first motivating factors into the creation of man, it is not because God was lonely. God did not create man because he was a lonely God that needed to be praised and needed to be worshipped and needed to be loved, so he had to create some being that would respond in that way. We, we know that because it says in Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the story of the Bible, as God has made all of the world and, and, and laid the table for the creation of man, who would be the crowning jewel of his creation, he says, let us make man in our image. The very beginning of the story of the Bible points us to a God that is complex in his being. It points us to the Father and the Son and the Spirit, perfectly three in one. And what that tells us is that God was not lonely before he created the world. He lived in perfect community and in perfect love in his being. That is why we can say with confidence that God in himself is love. It is part of his essence. So he didn't create us because he was lonely. He created us that we would reflect this perfection of love and community in our lives. He created us to join him in the joy of love. He created us because he loved us. He wanted to share in the perfection of his community. And the other thing that this can tell us, a, a glance at Genesis to inform us as to why love is so foundational is because in, in this passage that we read, it's not just that God requires love of us. It says in verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good. That God is requiring us and commanding us to walk with him because God, as our creator and our designer, knows what we need. He knows what is good for us. And as we journey through the Bible and you come across the requirements and the commandments and the will of God for your life, remember that lesson here that when there is a requirement of God 
on your life, it is not because God wants to keep you from something that you would enjoy. It is because God knows what is good for us. And his requirements and laws point us towards something good. And one of the really good things about being in a relationship that is walking with God is that it brings us back to the core of the vitality of who we are as created beings that we have life in God. We go back to Genesis, and this is what Genesis says about the the essence of our being with God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The story of God creating man is a story of God giving life. Remember that. This is one of those bits of theology that can wear down with time because we get so used to the life that we have that we think somehow we can sustain it in ourselves. But we get these daily reminders that our life is slowly wearing out unless we go somewhere to revive our life. Enter food. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, taking something that was alive and bringing life to our body. But here's the thing. Genesis points us to a creation that is much more than just physical. Genesis is creating us, is is pointing us to a creation that is a physical being, but a relationship with a spiritual God. And you, whether you realize it or not, have more to life than just your body. One of the ways that we can see this truth in our culture without looking at the book of Genesis is the the recent numbers showing that there is a decline in people's interest in religion or religious adherence. Less people are going to church. And yet, even as that number declines, the number of people interested in spirituality is on the rise. There are more people interested in some sort of transcendence. There is a sense inside all of us that there is more to our life than just our physical life, and it is pointing us back to the beginning of how life is breathed into us. And just like you need food for your body, you need to know the God who is the source of all life for your soul. What does that look like for you? And that is one of the ways that we have to answer the question of how we walk with God and why it is good. It is because God provides life for the inner man and the inner woman that we so desperately need. And that life that we have in a relationship with God begins to inform all of the secondary things of our life. And this is where we find a second answer as to why it is good to walk with God. One is that he is the source of life and spending time with him, we get rejuvenated in our lives. And the second, like it, is the importance of the rhythm of life that is revealed to us in the creation account. First, God breathed life into man. And then, for the first time in all of the creation account, God sees something that is not good. Remember the first six days of creation? It's one thing after the other that God creates that is good. And yet, he sees man in Genesis chapter 2 and says, it is not good for man to be alone. And so God creates out of man woman, that they would be together and she would serve as a helpmate to man. And not only do we get this life from God, but we also get this opportunity for community from God. And it has to come in that order. It gives us this amazing rhythm for our lives that can inspire us to live in community the way that it was intended to be. That we are born into this rhythm, if we look to what it means to love God, that there is a love of God that pushes us towards the love of people. And the great commandments that are given one and two are chronological. They matter the order. We have to love God, the greatest commandment. The second commandment is like it, that we would then love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can't mix up that order. It is so important that we are filled with the life that God gives us as we walk with him before we try to be part of a relationship or a community that is going to represent his love within that community. Have you ever felt that becoming bad? 
backwards. Have you ever felt those times in your life where people just drain you? And because you're drained, you start acting annoyed or you start acting short or you start acting frustrated and you just run out of the patience that it is required to love people. It is pointing you back to the rhythm of needing to be filled with God's love, needing to be filled with the life for your soul that can bring life to a relationship. And this is not just a message for the way that you need to interact with your coworkers that bother you sometimes, or the neighbors that play loud music because uh, even though they live in an apartment, they thought it'd be a good idea to buy subwoofers. Um, this is a message for every relationship in your life. Men, this is a message for the way that you are to serve your wife in love and kindness. Women, this is a message for the way that you are to be a helper and a, a partner to your husband. We cannot be in the relationship that reflects God community unless we are being recharged by God, being full of his spirit in us. Even marriages need time apart, being filled with the life of God again and renewed. Friendships need time apart where people can be in love with God so that the relationship has the fountain of love pouring out of it. Think of it this way. I'm going to use a little bit of an abstract example, but it helped my brain when I heard it. There is this, I'm kind of a gadget guy. Um, there is a wave in the technology of our day that is pointing us to the reality of electric cars. Does any of you, do any of you drive an electric car? Watch, in 10 years, this poll will look totally different, I promise you. Right now, we're on the cusp. Electric cars have not taken the country by storm, and there's one main problem for that. Electric cars have limited range. They need to be charged. And the, the technology has been fairly limited up until about two or three years ago. But amazing breakthroughs are happening. Last year, Tesla came out with the Model S, and on one charge, this electric car can go 400 miles. 400 miles on one charge. That's starting to compete with your, your tank of gas style of, of, of transportation. So electric cars are making great strides, but here is the catch. Here's the catch on how you can actually get 400 miles out of one charge. Here's what needs to happen. The moment you leave that charge dock, you need to get right on the freeway, set your cruise control for 60 miles per hour, and find a 400-mile stretch, uh, 400 stretch of the freeway that does not have any twists or turns, no elevation drops, and no stops in the way that people are going to require you to change lanes. It has to be smooth sailing the entire time, and then you'll get 400 miles. What is more likely, what is much more realistic, is to look at the low end of what you would get out of one charge, 150 to 200 miles, cut in half. Why does that low end exist, and why is it more realistic? Because 99.9% .9 of us who use cars deal with stop-and-go traffic, and we deal with elevation changes, and we deal with twists and turns in the road because it is almost impossible to find a road that is so open that you can cut, you can have 60 miles per hour on cruise control the entire time. Now, so many times in life, we live in relation to God in the way that we need to be filled in the life that he gives us as if we are going to leave the presence that has filled us with joy and peace and kindness and a motivation to walk in love. As, and we feel like we can, we can get enough from that short time with him that we'll go 400 miles and we'll check back in later sometime. But what's more realistic? What's realistic is that when we leave this church, whatever has been restorative and renewing from the word of God going into your hearts, you will have all sorts of bumps in the road this week. You're going to have all sorts of times where you have to stop and go and people are going to annoy you and people are going to cut you off and the elevation will change all of a sudden and it can happen between you and your wife or you and your husband, you and your neighbor, you and your coworker, you and a stranger. There is all sorts of reasons for us to stop and realize that we need to go back and get recharged and that is why we have to be a church that actually loves God Otherwise, we won't be able to go down this journey that he has for us. We'll, we'll, we'll run out of charge. And our call to live like Jesus and, and be a representation of God's love to the community or to a family or to a neighbor will have no energy left 
because we're not actually spending time being filled in our soul so that we can go through the ups and downs of life. What does that look like for you? Well, for this church, practically the best way for us to do that, this is, a, this is an all-encompassing thing that we need to do, is to get alone with God, to find time where you can spend allowing him to recharge your life, recharge your heart to be a reflection of his perfect love. We get this really amazing example of this all throughout the Gospels. What, one in specific In Mark chapter 6, Jesus has just sent out his disciples to be on mission, to go and do great things in his name. And when they come back, they are so fired up. This would be the category of time with people. They're out doing things motivated by the call of Jesus on their lives. And it says in verse 31, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no time to even eat. The rhythm of our lives has to include times where we are being sent by God to do things in his name, by his power, by his love. And part of that rhythm has to include going back to the primary thing that motivates it all, time spent walking with him, being renewed in our love for him. Go away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest. What does that look like for your life? That can be one of the great challenges of all the things that we do in the name of church. Because this, in, in, in our gathering time, is a great way for us to corporately worship and be filled by the word. But it cannot be an all-comprehensive, active way for you to be resting in God. Remember, the disciples were doing ministry. Which means, for me, writing a sermon and preaching, and spending time in prayer with the church, and for those of you who serve on the weekends, for those of you who want to lead your family well and disciple your children, all of those amazing things that you're doing because you're called by Jesus to to live like him, but that's not your rest with God. There needs to be a rhythm of your life that is, is part of what we see in Genesis, that we walk with God and that motivates us into a community that he has for us. Be refreshed this year. What would it look like if this year, next time, Calvary Chapel, Boise, and everybody who called this church home took specific time, not just to do ministry and to help out, but specific time to grow in the knowledge of who God is for your life. Grow in the love that you have for God, to grow in the majesty and the awe of who he is in your life. What would that look like if we had an entire church that was dedicated to growing in love with God? And here's a real practical way that that looks. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. I love when the Bible gives such clear word pictures. It says, like newborn babies, we are called to long for the word. There is no greater way to have intimacy and love with God than by spending time reading the word that he has brought, the revelation of who he is through, the story of God in his word, what God loves, what God hates, how he interacts with people, how he responds to prayer. It is all in his word. If only we would take time to read it. The picture of a newborn hits so close to home for our family because in October we welcomed in our third little baby girl, which means we have the example of a crying baby longing for milk every day, every morning and every night. And my wife gets bonus on this lesson because she actually wakes up in the night to listen to the cry too. I sleep through that and I'm sorry for that. Every time that baby cries, there is only one solution. 
We have one of those trick babies that it, it, it's so clear what she wants when, when she's crying that you think that you've mastered parenthood and they're going to trick you into having a bunch more babies because all she wants when she cries is the milk of her mother. And there's nothing I can do that will satisfy her. There's no blankie. There's no rocking. There's no, there's no position I can put her in. When she is crying, she has to have milk. And I love that picture, that there is supposed to be a hunger inside of us that would replicate the cry of a baby that would look to God's word and only God's word to satisfy us. And so here's another question of this morning. Why aren't we hungry? Why is that picture so inspiring to love God's word like a baby longs for milk and yet so often in my life, I am not hungry like that. Why is that? Why is that sometimes true for your life or even for our church? We get an example of what I think is an answer in Micah chapter 6 in the verses that are before what we already read. Before the prophet says what the Lord does require and what is good, he has to deal with a bunch of false ideas about what God is waiting for to make right with his people. It says in verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No. He has told you, O man, what is good. Justice, kindness, walk with him. That verse that has been the foundation of our mission to walk with God, love God, is a contrast to all the ways that the people of God in this day were getting it wrong. And here's the reality. The reason we don't hunger is because we aren't hungry because our diet is filled with junk. Babies don't have that luxury. They have one option for food. They're only going to get the milk. And yet, as we grow and it starts very young, we start replacing that good, healthy, hungry that points us to one thing that is good for us, and we replace it with junk. I hope that this resonates with you because January is sometimes the month where we realize, wow, we've been eating poorly. <laughs> this December, what were we eating? What were we thinking? Look, the way, look at myself in the mirror, and I'm like, I need to clean my diet. And the same is true with the diet of our soul. If our soul is not longing to be with God, if it's not longing to be in his word, to, to, be, to be in a way walking with him by new revelations daily, meditating on what his word says about him, there is something in our life in the form of junk food for our soul. If you know the story of Adam and Eve, you know that they made a mistake of replacing God with something that was horrible for them. It actually came in the form of food and it caused a downward spiral for their lives that caused them to hide from God, hide from the God who gave them life, who walked with them, who gave them community with one another. And the story of the Bible is about the great lengths that God will go through to make sure that we don't have to hide anymore. That the substitutes that we replace with God cause us to turn our back from him. And we all repeat the same tragic story of the first man and the first woman replacing God with something that would cause distance. Instead of walking with God, you walk away from God. What is the substitute in your diet? that has taken the place of walking with God through time spent in his word. There are so many ways that we could answer that question. Some of us, it's just this desire to be successful, to walk in the ways of the success of this world, to find pleasure, to have sex, to have fun on the weekends, to watch Netflix when you get home because it's been a long day or a long week and you don't have time to be in awe. Some of us, it's Candy Crush on our phone. Some of us, it's Instagram. Some of us, it's Facebook. What if we as a church, the people who make up this church, instead of our instinct being to pull out our phone and finding the substitute, finding that thing that we could look at instead of awe and majesty for God, what if we looked at the psalm of the day? 
What if instead of pulling out our phone to see what other people have been up to or to numb the, the, the pain of, of whatever we're going through, we pulled out the Bible and we spent time filling our mind and our hearts with more of who God is. And I think that, again, we look at the year that's ahead of us, all that God wants to do in this church, in our families, in our lives, what would it look like next year this time if we look back and said, wow, by the reading of God's word, a devotion to walk with him in my own private life, I have grown so much in the love that I have for him, and it has affected the community around me. I have grown so much in who he is in my life that I'm actually starting to pray and see answered prayers, and it has affected my life. What would our year look like in the beginning of next year if we were a church who found and identified all the substitutes that we replace God with and we turn from them in that simple act of what the Bible calls repentance and we found the refreshment of loving God again. We found the renewal of being in awe of his majesty, not taking anything for granted for what he has done for our lives. What would that look like? And that's my prayer. That is my hope. I hope that if you call Calvary Chapel Boise your home, you will join in the mission of loving God in that way. And that as we grow in our love for God, we would grow in the representation of Jesus to this city. Because I can't help but notice that walking with God comes with a couple of other things. It says that he has told us what is good and what is required to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. It is impossible to separate a true loving relationship with God from the things that he loves. I was actually two weeks ago traveling down to Salt Lake City with my wife and family to visit uh, Daniela's grandma Yolanda. If you're in the name for uh, market for a name, I love the name Yolanda. I haven't heard it in a while. Um, that's free of charge this morning. Um, and as we're going down there, I found myself so excited. She only comes to America about every three years. She lives in Colombia and she visit Salt Lake City as kind of the hub for the family. And as we're going down, I, I just found myself picturing sitting there, practicing Spanish, watching Daniela and her talk and catch up for the three years they haven't seen each other. And I realized that I love Daniela's grandma as if she was my grandma. And if it wasn't for Daniela, she'd just be another woman from Colombia that I don't know. And yet, because Daniela loves her, I can't help but love her. Our relationship informs what I love and what I pray for as a church, that the love of God would come with what God loves. That we would love the people that God loves. And here's the crazy good news. God loves so far beyond what we love or who we love. God loves the distant and the broken and the people who are still hiding from him, still using those substitutes as a way to try to find life apart from him. He has not given up on any single one of us. What if we were a church that loved him so much that we felt the same way about the people of our city? about the lost, the broken, the poor, the elderly, the widows, the ones that are overlooked. The more we love God, the more we will love who he loves. That's why it has to be the primary mission of our church before we can talk about what comes next. This will not happen randomly, and this is the application to go and do likewise. This is the point where I hope you take notes and you think about what this looks like for your life because the love of God that we want to experience as a church will not happen randomly. It won't, you won't leave here and find yourself stumbling into some sort of alone time with God. Jesus says to get away by yourselves to a desolate place. Jesus had a time and a place and a plan. And I want to challenge you to find an answer to those three categories of what it means for you to grow in the knowledge of who God is by reading his word and spending time with him. What is your time for that? You make time for the things that you love. And if you don't know when your time with God is tomorrow, today, you probably won't find it. For me, I have to be disciplined at night because my time is first thing in the morning. In the winter months, I want to start that fire and sit next to the fire on our couch and spend time at the beginning of our day, my day with God. What is your time? What if it was morning? What if it was that lunch hour or night? What does your time with God look like this week? The second thing is your place. 
Where are you going to go? Where's your place to get alone by yourself without the distractions of a phone or a television or all the people in your life who love you and want your attention? Where are you going to go this week with God to walk with him in a specific place that is for you guys, for you and the Lord to grow in love with him? And finally, what is your plan? And I say that as an invitation to join who we are as a church for this year, to go through the entire Bible. When you get to that time and place with God, what are you going to talk to him about? And what part of the word are you looking to him to reveal himself to you more and more? If you already know that, then I pray that this week would be a week full of grace where you overcome all the obstacles that want to come between that time and that place and that plan for your life. And if you've never done something like this, you've picked a perfect week to come to church because we just started a plan as a church. To start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation. And as you leave here, you can find some information about how to get started with that plan. And for those of you who are not just visiting from out of town, but visiting from outside the the church community or what it means to follow God, I'm so glad you're here because we are all people that were made in the image of this God to know him. And he has invited you here this morning to know him. He's got a specific way to reveal himself to you. And even if you aren't even sure if you believe the Bible yet, take a chance, read it. What if God really did put the whole world into motion? What if there really was a creator of every sunset and every sunrise and every mountain range and every ocean? And what if he wanted really a relationship with you? That's what you're being invited into as part of this church. And we hope and pray that by God's perfect timing for your life, you would know that God that wants to be in a relationship with you. We are all going to be invited now to take communion which is a celebration of the way that the hiding was dealt with. That God so loved the world, he sent his son so that none of us would perish. None of us would die in our hiding place with our substitutes that will never bring us life. Jesus died so that we could be in a relationship with God again. He dealt with all of the things that make us want to hide. 